Hello, my name is Jorb. I love gear. Imagine for me, the year 1995. Yes, it was the year of my birth, but we don't need to talk about that. In the gear world, the most recent NPC was the 3000. We're only three revisions into the NPC, if you even count uh, the 60 Mark II as its own revision. A two if you don't, and we're 10 years before things like the SP404. Sure, rack mount samplers exist, but hands-on performance samplers certainly is not the mature product category that it is today. And Roland releases this. The JS30, it is an 8-bit sampler from 1995. I hadn't heard of it at all until I saw Marlo Diggs feature it on his channel. If you aren't familiar, you should look him up. He's a real one. <laughs> anyway, uh, I went looking for one, and I put down some eBay alerts. One showed up from a Goodwill. Uh, I ordered it right off. It was 150 bucks. No power cable. When it showed up, uh, it did need a bit of work, but why would I pay $150 for a sampler with less than 23 seconds at full resolution or 45 at half? It's a sampling time, no really good user interface, no features that make it stand out. Why would anybody want a crummy old sampler in 2022? What can you do with it that can't be done better by something else? Why should I go through the trouble of fixing it? If it's not a video that'll get tons of views and it's not uh, something you know I can make a big profit on if I eventually sell it, what's the point? Well, that's what the video is going to be about. I have a few suggestions for using it uh, paired with modern gear in ways that it can still be useful to us in 2022. I'm going to step you through what I did to repair it, and I'm going to give you a sort of quick start guide, we'll call it, on if you have one that you got from a pawn shop or a thrift store or whatever, how do you sit down and actually use the thing? And this video will be broken into chapters, and I only want you to watch the parts that interest you. If you complain about something you don't care about, <laughs> and I only want you to watch the parts that actually interest you. <laughs> if you just want to see me fix it, because you have one that's broken or something else similar, there'll be a chapter just for that. If you just want to know how to use one, because you ended up with one from, you know, your uncle's attic or whatever, there's a section for that. If you just want to know if it's something that might be worth your time, you want to see examples of it being used to actually make some noise, just chapter just for that. No, I won't be mad if you skip around. I only want you to watch the bits that you're actually interested in. And speaking of what you're interested in, it's probably gear, right? That's funny. Me too. <laughs> well, if you like what you see, it helps me a lot. If you like the video, it helps me grow. If you subscribe, uh, I will appreciate it. You can see more just like it. I'm never, I will never do a second take. <laughs> <laughs> of my pitch. I hate saying it in the first place. Back to the sampler. I ordered it off of eBay. It showed up a week or two later. Uh, very well packed from Goodwill, so kudos there. But opening it up, my first thought, my first impression was, this smells like a smoky garage. Oh, man, it's a little smoky. That's okay. So, you know, not extremely bad, but noticeable and sort of annoying uh, when it wasn't part of the listing and I didn't expect it. But I am the right sort of person to solve a problem like that, but I plugged it in right when I got it, and as you can hear, there's one really obvious problem. There's only audio in one side, and two problems that are probably less obvious to you as a viewer. I tried to demonstrate it, but the keyboard buttons are really touchy. They're re-triggering, sometimes they don't trigger at all, uh, and the jog wheel is really loose in the space that it fits in. So I expected to do something to it, but I got right to opening it up, didn't take much to separate the top and the bottom. There weren't that many screws on the front and the back. And then the top and the bottom separate one ribbon cable to detach and then three uh, like header pins to pull off. And the first thing I did was tighten up the jog wheel. Just to show you very quickly, there's your opportunity to do that. Uh, the rest of the screws that held in the PCB panel, I took all those off. That let me get to the plastic buttons, which were held in place by this foam that is sort of sticky. I don't know if it's like a spray glue to keep them in place, or over time it had gotten sticky. Uh, but that's what had stayed garage smelling. That's what had stayed cigarette smoky. But just an aside, the front side of this panel PCB, I think it's beautiful. There's like the exposed uh, orange bits, bright orange bits, where the screws attach. There's that one like solid row. It looks like, you know, vertical highway footage of just a bunch of uh, resistors. And then you can tell each of the resistors staggered around uh, the segment display, the seven segment displays. It's each of one is trying to get a different vertical column. I think it's beautiful circuit design, just barely pre-service mount where these things look completely different. Anyway, <laughs> something that surprised me while I was in there, this board is made in Italy. I had no idea Roland ever manufactured anything in Italy. And that explains why in the manual, it's in two columns. There's a column in Italian and then pictures, 
and then a column in English and a column in Spanish or maybe something else. I'm not really sure. But anyway, <laughs> back to work. I took all the buttons out of that slightly sticky foam, set them all aside. I put the whole case in the sink and scrubbed it with soap to try and get rid of any of that smell. The buttons, too, spent some time in warm, soapy water. Those are left to dry, safe and sound, so I can work on the next thing, solving my audio being only on one channel. So I tested all three of the top-mounted faders right here. That's the master volume, the mic volume, and the sampling input level. And they were all measuring way out of spec. They're supposed to be uh, 10K ohms each, and none of them were, were close to that. Uh, so I took them out of the circuit, just in case being in the circuit was changing the readings I would get, just to be sure. Pretty straightforward desoldering. Their stereo faders, and there was an extra leg for either one end of the conductive trace or the wiper, I can't remember which, but there's four pins for each side and then two pins in the middle attached to the case just for mounting and to make sure your orientation can't be wrong, which I appreciate <laughs> as somebody who moves a little bit too fast when they work on these, but I use one of those mechanical desoldering pumps uh, that's never let me down, and I had to bend the mounting pins back with a dental pick, but once I had them out, I took one apart just to see the inside, maybe clean it, but you can see that you can hardly tell that there's individual tracks. It should be sort of a copper color. It, they shouldn't be flat black like this. And I don't know if that was a dust cover disintegrating or dust and dirt stuck together with fader lubricant or just oxidation. Who knows? They were gunky and they were not working at all. Anyway, if I'm editing this the right way, <laughs> what you'll see is me measuring the full length of the conductive track. And so it should be uh, 10k ohms, but one of them was reading all the way up at 120, which is way too high, and it's reading extra resistance because there's junk on the conductive faders that the signal is also trying to go through. It's also trying to go through that oxidation, or maybe the connection is just barely there in some traces, and it's going through more track than it would have otherwise. Some of that's conjecture, some of that's fact, but well, the point is they were reading way out of spec. That lets me know the faders are bad. That lets me know I need to replace them. Uh, took kind of a lot of digging. I found exact replacements. And even though I'd only heard the issue in the master volume fader, I didn't check functionality of the sampling level um, or the mic volume. Since they were all reading out of spec and they were all the same part in almost the same place, worth it to me just to replace all three of them. That's that's moving along fine. Remember our other problem, the buttons were kind of iffy. Um, so I set up to replace tech switches for the whole key bed. And I already had some tech switches. I just keep them on hand anymore. Um, but I wanted to replace just... Everything that is, you know, part of the keyboard, quote unquote, these performance bits up here, and then the hold button and the button for starting and stopping sampling right in the corner, because those all felt pretty important to this being functional <laughs> and it being easy to actually sit down and use this. So I won't go over this part in detail either. It's identical to the process I followed in the D50 tax switch repair video, which I'll put a card wherever the hell those go. <laughs> but I snipped the four legs and then there's a bit of leg left in the panel. Uh, heat that up, pull it out, desolder each hole, clear enough for me to punch in the replacement button, and then solder all of those. So I replaced all those switches, I replaced the three faders, pretty much the same process. Everything got soldered in, closed back up to test, and the buttons were good. So that is it fixed. I did have a panel button fall inside while I was closing it up. Oh. Is it loose in there? God, where is that? But that wasn't much trouble to fix. I just had to unscrew everything again, pull it out, stick it in the right spot, and make sure it didn't fall out while I reassembled. So yes, that was kind of a lot of work for something that's not worth that much money and not something I'm particularly invested in, really a fascination. Uh, but that's why I did it. I'm fascinated by this. And it's not super relevant, and, you know, it hasn't, like, persisted as part of you know, synthesizer, zeitgeist, or sampler vocabulary, or, you know, there's no cult of lo-fi that loves the JS-30. Maybe there is. I don't know. Maybe it's starting. <laughs> but that's not the point. I didn't do this because it's super unique or super special. I did it because I'm fascinated by it. And, you know, whatever unseen hands guide the market or the algorithm don't think this is worth it, it's worth my time. And now that it's in better shape, I might find it more inspiring and Whenever I'm done with it, whenever it leaves my hands, it's in better shape for the next person. It'll last even longer. I'm really proud of that. I'm really proud to be a link in that chain. So anyway, that's the repair section done. Let's move on to how it sounds and how to actually work it. And I think a lot of that is best described while I'm actually working with the sampler. So let's move over to the table for that part. All righty. 
Let's start with what was chosen as factory sounds on a DJ marketed sampler from 1995. You're not going to believe it. It's kind of funny. <laughs> Great. Cool. That was amazing. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh. <laughs> anyway, if you're a radio DJ or something, maybe you're Ow! <laughs> hitting us with the dolphin, but I really don't know. Uh they were thinking with that. Some of them are great, some of them are very, very silly. But that's bank one. I actually might keep that. I have two that might be corrupted. Because just really high high pitched noises. And the mute does nothing. Some cool synth sounds, honestly. I wonder what they used to record those. And this is actually also really, really dope. Just kind of a spacey chord. And the third one is really a drum kit. I've changed it a little bit. There might be a tambourine lost to time in here, but... You guys recognize these? Cool, and there's two user banks that I haven't put anything in yet. But quickly, how these things work. There are three modes, play, record, and edit, and the straight line of buttons to the left all relate to just that mode. So in play mode, uh, I'll stay on the drum kit actually. You have different zones, kind of like a key group if you're used to Akai stuff, uh, where you define a different sample. So. This very highest one, if I hold sample, I can change it. That tambourine wasn't anywhere else, so we'll do that. You can set the lower and upper limit of what keys, if I'm sure you can tell. This is just like a keyboard. <laughs> that, that sample will be active, that that sample will be the one you're hearing. And we can control some other stuff about it. Shift is a pitch shift. You can go really, really low. Lovely. I'm going to get it back up to zero. Jog wheel after tightening it up feels way, way better. Pitch shift or BPM shift is like a fine tune. I will get it all the way back up to zero again. And level is, of course, your volume. Cool. That's all pretty self explanatory. The blue labels underneath, I hope you can see those. I might take a close-up of the panel and just keep pulling it back up. But we have second function of attack decay, sustain, release. And I'm actually going to change to a different sample so we can hear it better. I thought it was yeah, 15. So there's just that chord. I'm going to add some attack. I'm going to add some release. A little more. And bit of decay and sustain lower than full. So we have full control over the amp envelope of that sound, and there is no filter, unfortunately. You can set it up to receive MIDI messages for hold and the pitch bend, and each zone right now is set to a single sample. So I will show you on user bank B, which currently has nothing. We're going to set up a sample. The lower limit is the bottom key we have access to, and the upper limit is the highest. And if I had a MIDI keyboard, I could set that to a different range or a wider range. And that is a chord, so I'm going to pick a single note. Ow. And I'm going to speed up the attack on that a little bit. I'm going to shift it up a whole octave. Really? 
really, really cool. <laughs> there is not an octave shift for this keyboard that I have found. But that is very usable as a sampled instrument on some really crunchy old hardware. So I think that's very, very cool. Okay, that is the play mode. I'm gonna show you the edit mode. And edit is about editing individual samples. Okay, and we have an individual sample chosen that I can change with the jog wheel here, or our up and down. We'll stick on this one, but a lot of these are kind of what you'd expect. So the start point of the sample, I'm going to jump way far ahead. I can skip that first kick. But that you knew. And does the same thing. Loop decides the loop point. So I'm going to just put it arbitrarily in the middle. You hear that loop? You hear that loop point is like randomly in the middle. So we'll hit. We'll start at the start point, and then once we make it to the end, we'll jump back to the loop point and then go between the loop and the end. That's simple as well. Truncate lets you delete parts, normalize, lets you normalize the sound, and recover will undo all those changes. You can also change the level of a click, and you can send the click just out of the headphones or the main left right, and I won't show you that either because I can't figure out quite how to get it. Okay, that's all that we can show you right now with the factory stuff. I'm going to go into record and we're going to record some of our own samples. And I'm going to use, do you guys know this? I don't know if I've ever said this. Um, autofocus doesn't work on any of the lens camera combinations I use, so everything I do is manually focused. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, it is only RCA out and in. So I'm going to use one of those adapters to just plug straight into my cell phone. Okay, I'm plugged into my phone, which I won't buy a phone without a headphone jack. So if I'm going to do that, I might as well make good use of it, right? Uh, I'm going to sample in some samples from a sample pack by a friend of mine and friend of the channel, Josh is Making Music, uh, that he put out for his 2,000 subscriber special. I think they're really fun. I encourage you to check him out. I really like his style, I really like his attitude. But I like these samples because they'll be great examples for us right here and right now. So, so once we're in record, it'll hit R and then blanks. We can hit this double time, which will give us twice the sampling time at half the resolution, which is what we want. I'm skipping ahead a bit, but if I hold second and hit this time, that tells us how much time we have remaining. 22.3 seconds. But if I hit time times two, we have 44.6. So it has this built-in feature to sample at double speed and then bring it back down to the original uh, length of the sample. So I'm going to move this fader halfway to the input so we hear the input as well. I can't figure out how to set the trigger level, to be honest with you guys. So I'm just going to start sampling when I start the sample. Let me see your level here. So I just want those first two parts, which is great. That's R1. And if I go now to edit. This is the same pitch. It already sounds a little crunchier. This is perfect for a uh, lo-fi Sunday, huh, Josh? <laughs> I think he's done a great job. But first things first, we need to get our start point a little better. I'm gonna hit truncate. And you'll see this process. We'll move up. Uh, which takes a really, really long time. And normalize is the same way. It just, like, will do this, like, process and click forever. Uh, it's kind of fun to watch it, but I wish it didn't take this long. <laughs> Actually, maybe I'll just speed it up. <laughs> okay, normalized. We've compressed it. We've made those artifacts a little more audible.
wonderful. So that's so we're already kind of jumping around, right? We recorded, then we went to edit. And now I'm going to go up to play. So we're in user bank A. All I have is one zone, and that zone goes from 60 to 60, which is just this bottom C. And I can pitch it down here. Great job, Josh. <laughs> I can loop it, it can be a one shot, or we can play it in reverse. You know what else we can do? I have the Empress Reverb. Can you see that? It's just barely at the end of these cables. I have the Empress Reverb plugged in. Hold that down. I can move to other banks. <laughs> There's one way. That sounds very, very good. I'm sure part of that, a big part of that is just how much I love the reverb. <laughs> I was sending some of my vocal to the reverb. I'm sure some of that was just how much I love the reverb, but it's something about this being crunchy. And I know part of this is the samples fitting for the style and fitting for what I'm trying to show you guys. But that's part of the why I want to talk about this, that this seems outdated and useless, but you can do some very, very cool things with it. And this is sort of the first thing I want to show you. You could perform right on this, and there's a few ways to do that, and I'm going to try and center myself and, and stay focused on the functionality I want to talk about. But there, that's the first way you can sort of use this. Looping something melodic and then just... <laughs> playing the rest of it over that live. And uh, you can do that in the same bank, or I can move back to Factory Bank 3. That's sort of the first way you can use this uh, as a modern sampling tool. Uh, it's nothing like a 404 or a 303 or a 202 even. But you can have crunchy samples and perform them live. And I don't spend that much time on this one because I think it's really cumbersome and really difficult. You saw how much I was moving between sample parameters and zone parameters, trying to figure out, and I've cut several examples of when I scrolled, when I wasn't pressing one of these buttons or alive one of these buttons, and I'm changing the uh, range of a different zone, a different key group, a different sample. Uh, so it's really a pain in the ass to try and use it like that live on its own. But I will say there are some things to help you get around that. So if I go to the factory bank, that's a drum machine, that's just drum samples. And I have set up the same hi-hat to be two different levels. There is a built-in sequencer. If I hit record, I pick one of these four lanes and then I don't remember <laughs> what part of the pattern I started on, but I can loop that. And that was not perfect at all. I can even trigger that just, I can trigger it on its own. I select it and I hit the start and stop, or I can assign it to its own pad. So this is that same user bank where we're at. And I can start our sample from there and stop it with that. Cool, so now we can use hold to loop something melodic, right? I can put one of our sampled sequences on hold to combine a couple other sounds. 
It could be our hi-hats like we saw, or I could record on a different channel. Just a kick in the snare. And I go back to my user bank, and I hold that, and I put it on. Whoops. User bank A. Now that's on G, and I can start that. And the other one I did <laughs> completely out of time together. But if I was very good about my timing, and I only had them looping once or whatever, you could use that to record multiple passes. One thing I wish it did is a sort of a resampling, but that sequencer is like steps, like MIDI information steps. So right now I've got sequencer track one triggering on this F. If I hit record, put it on track four, and hit that F, I can stop it right away. And if I start it, it won't play that. I really, really wish that you could stack them like that because I can't figure out if there's a way to lock these in time with each other. So if you try and base your time off of one and record it, you barely, I keep having the problem where I just barely miss the start or the stop. And so over time, as it keeps looping, they get more and more out of sync with each other. It's cool that they're not synced. I, I don't know if I'm missing it. The manual's like 300 pages. It's actually really horrible. <laughs> uh, so if I've missed that, let me know. But um, I don't think these sequencer lanes are great either for doing more than one part at a time. They're great if I just want to loop a hi-hat or if I just want to loop... Where did I put that? <laughs> Maybe I overwrote it. There was a kick and a snare somewhere, but anyway, those are the most obvious, like, okay, what can this do? If I have this in my hands, what can I use it for? I think there's definitely value in the sound, period, but maybe not the performance ability of it on its own. So one thing I did, I had my roommate, a drummer, Mikey Bags. <laughs> He's in a band called Hot Cunch. I will link them in the description below if you want to check it out. But I had him, same thing, just on my phone, send me a video of him playing drums. Gotta hit him with the bull. I recorded that through this. Also recorded um, some uh, chord hits on my roads. Straight into this. And then I recorded out of this straight into my live two. And then I sequenced those things in the live two when I play them live in a live two. So there's the result of that right now. I think that's a very interesting way to try and use this just as a sound processor. And getting this crunch and getting this lo-fi sound on samples you want to do something else with. There is a third way to do something very, very similar. And I'm going to move some other gear on screen now to show you that. I'm having tons of trouble <laughs> getting these both to show up like spaced well on camera, so I don't care. <laughs> these two rectangles are just going to be diagonal in frame. I hope you like it. But I have my MPC live here, and the only thing I have plugged in, there's no audio coming out of the live, is just MIDI out to the MIDI in of the JS30. And I have set my pad perform mode to start on C0 and be chromatic. Go! That is exactly the same as if I started in the first factory bank, 1, 2, F1, F2, F3, which is factory 1, 2, 3, 
and I can trigger them from here. And that works all the way to my user banks, which uh, I think, how high do I have to go? That works all the way to my user banks. And so user one on, this is C starting at C3. One nice thing, but when we're doing it with external MIDI, we are velocity sensitive. I have nothing for the C sharp on user bank one. But I have everything else. And I can sequence my pattern in MIDI just from here. So I'm going to start recording. I'm going to turn this on so I can hear my click. So now, where we're at, and I'm gonna change it so you can see the screen a little better. If I flip through our tracks here, we can see that I've just recorded MIDI for uh, all these different parts. And I like this way of working. I think I might prefer just to get the audio into this, pitch it down, normalize it a bunch of times, and then resample it here into the MPC, and then have control and then have control over really every step of it, like I did uh, with that Rhodes Jam plus uh, my roommate on the, on the phone sample through here. That to me is the perfect way to use this and make good on it in a modern setup, but there are other ways to use it. So I hope any one of those was helpful. If there was any part of this you needed, I hope you got a glimpse at it. But I'm going to return to face cam for the very, very end of this. So there you go. In, in some ways this does feel prototypical of uh, the Boss SP202 and the Roland 303 and 404. There are elements of what this does and what it can do that clearly made it into those devices. Having a built-in sequencer, for example, seems to have start, started here. But it's definitely for a different type of user, and that makes it really, really interesting. It has that fader to go between uh, the input and just the uh, JS30, and there's a mic input as well. So it does seem like it is for DJs. Maybe you're on the radio and you want to play, you know, your dolphin sound or whatever in between breaks or you want to react to something with, you know, like an air horn DJ. Uh, it's really cool that that is a product they thought would be worthwhile. I don't know how well they did at the time, but all that said, it could be as cool as it wants, but it's a pain in the ass to use. It's not easy to figure out your zones. It's not easy to move between the play mode and the edit mode and remember which one you need to be in to do a certain thing. It is really not a great user experience. But because it's an 8-bit sampler, it sounds cool. It just sounds good. And does it sound better than a lo-fi effect that I could just plug up on the Live 2 or on a 404? I don't know if it sounds better, but this is truly converting something to 8 bits and then bringing it around. I've, for a while, had this sort of respect or this reverence, I guess, for the idea of passing down an individual group of data, an individual sound recorded in some way pass to another medium, pass to another medium. And, you know, Mike just recorded himself playing drums on his phone, not thinking anything of it. And that sound now has more providence because I played it off of my phone into this crummy sampler, and now it's on my live too. And if I want it, that drum break, maybe I'll pull it out for something else. I, I think that's fascinating. I like the happenstance of that. I like the serendipity of that. That's just the sound I chose. And hip-hop is built on that. Hip-hop is built on, this is the drum break we chose, this is the hi-hats we chose, all of that. And whatever artifacts or whatever circumstances brought that individual sound to be recorded on that day in that way, that is now part of whatever you're making with it. That's part of your music or, for me, just these demonstrations. And I really, really love that. So <laughs> this, whatever it was originally for, I'm going to keep it around as as a way to crunch up drum samples in a way to add that lo-fi flavor to my roads or whatever else because it does it quite well and if all I'm doing is recording through it it's not that inconvenient at all especially if I have it plugged in well with a patch pay or something which I'll probably do soon but 
anyway, of the ways I showed you to use it, I probably would not find myself ever again <laughs> using just the unit. I don't think that I'll be sequencing it with MIDI either. Probably I'll be crunching up samples and then and then bringing them onto the live too. If you end up with one, I encourage you to try and use it whichever way fits for you. But if you're interested in them, you're thinking about buying them because you saw probably Marlon Diggs and then me by association. If you're thinking about buying one to do something specific with it, I wouldn't buy it if you just want to perform on it. I wouldn't buy it necessarily if you plan on sequencing it with MIDI. It, it depends on, the, on your workflow. You could probably make that work for you. But if you want a way to crunch up your sounds and get some lo-fi flavor, I think it's a great option. So there you go. My name's Joel Orb. I love gear. I have a soft spot for the in-between stuff. Certainly includes this. Thanks for watching. So long. Hope to see you in the next one. Cheers. Mm -hmm.